Alright hey guys, welcome to chapter 9, Reflections and Visual Aids Commentary. Uh, the Worlds of Islam, Afro-Eurasian Connections. And for the Reflections, we're going to look at a past and present, choosing our history. You know, people look to history to understand the world uh, we now inhabit. What can history tell us about the Islamic world today? Well, the dangerous practice of using history... Um, for our present purposes happens and yet we need to use history to understand the world in which we live now, Islam has a glorious history of achievement from 600 to 1600 and then a period of humiliating Western encroachment and intrusion uh, but it reminds us of a central role uh, in the Afro-Eurasian world for over a thousand years and it, you know, it was followed by several centuries of that Western imperialism. Um, and that's been its recent history. Some Muslims want to use examples from the glorious Islamic past to overcome the legacy of humiliation. And those we might call fundamentalists often look to the period of the life of Muhammad and the first four caliphs as a source for their agenda. And so they're really using uh, the Islamic past. And when breaking with Western dominance, uh, we became more distant, uh, past, and inspiration. And we must remember um, the Islamic world is very diverse. Um, there's, you know, tremendous cultural, historic, linguistic, ethnic, and gender diversity in the Islamic world. And it's best to try and avoid generalizations about Islam as a single unit. And, um, you know, it, Islamic modernizers look to achievements in science and scholarship as foundation for more open engagement with the West. Um, but history reveals great diversity and debate in the Islamic world, and the past points um, to considerable variation in the interactions of Muslim and others. And we must recognize that there have been periods of both tolerance and cooperation and mistrust and violent conflict between the Islamic world and the West. Hmm. Okay, uh, here we go. Visual source, uh, chapter 9. This is the first one, Muhammad and the Arch, uh, Arch, Archangel uh, Gabriel. So what impression of this encounter does the artist seek to convey by... Um, the posture of the two figures. So let's start with um, start with that. And the commanding presence of Gabriel uh, is expressed through his standing pose, with the outstretched arm and the pointing finger. And Muhammad is in a seated position and is avoiding uh, direct eye contact with Gabriel, which conveys his role as a receiver of Allah's revelations. Um, and so. Gabriel is the um, authoritative or um, commanding, uh, you know, presence here while Muhammad is taking it all in. And, you know, what religious meaning might Muslims derive from the idea that the revelation to Muhammad came through an angelic messenger rather than directly from Allah? That's interesting. Um, you know, that Allah works through messengers like his prophet Muhammad. And that even Muhammad did not come regularly, or you know, regularly, into uh, the direct presence of Allah, making his you know night journey all the more remarkable. And um, that, um, what is this uh, visual source is about? This is the night journey of Muhammad. Uh, what significance might attach to the female head of the Barak? Well, it makes the Barak an unmistakably mythical beast rather than a common domesticated animal. Right. You know, emphasizing the otherworldliness of this event. And the Brock made it possible for Muhammad to make such a lengthy journey in one night. Oh, so that's very important. 
But what are the accompanying angels offering to the uh, prophet during his journey? That's interesting. Um, the angel before him looks, you know, uh, looks like he's holding a lamp. Maybe, perhaps, uh, helping to light his way. Or just below the prophet, an angel holds flames. A traditional symbol of holiness in Persian art. Um, another angel behind the prophet is playing an instrument. Perhaps announcing his approach. There are other angels that are bringing a variety of items that might be meant to help the prophet on his journey. Or it might be gifts of traditional hospitality. You know, who's visiting the seven levels of heaven. And the angels might, you know, they may be acting like courtiers in a royal court, escorting an important visitor into the presence of God. So what meaning might the artist seek to represent by the image of the world below and slightly to the right of the Baroque, right? Here it is in the world. Here. Well, the ascent of Muhammad into heaven right that's probably what they were hoping to convey by this in this image I think it's interesting um, what is the significance of Muhammad's encounter with the earlier prophets like Abraham Moses and Jesus because there's a Quranic reference to Jesus in this document. Well, Muhammad is defined in the Muslim faith as the last great prophet in a tradition that included Abraham, Moses, and uh, Jesus as other prophets. And Muhammad praying with these figures emphasizes that they all come from the same prophetic tradition and that Muhammad's message is in accordance with his predecessors. It also physically reminds viewers that his message was the final word from God that provides insights beyond those of his predecessors. Very interesting thoughts. Okay, the Battle of Badr. Uh, what elements of this image might suggest a natural or human understanding as the, of the Muslim victory? Ed Butter, and what might indicate a divine intervention as the explanation? Well, in terms of natural or human understanding, the uh, well-ordered ranks of horsemen convey the image of a very powerful army capable of victory, right? Uh, the angel conveying the news of the victory to Muhammad in the center of the image implies a divine support for Muhammad's cause and perhaps a divine purpose. In the victory, you know, documentary sources report only two horses and 70 camels on the side of the quote unquote believers at this battle and suggest a more uh, ragtag group of fighters than what the image actually portrays. So, why do you think the artist presented a, you know, a rather more impressive picture? Well, the key to Muhammad's success was careful drilling of his well organized troops. And the perfect lines of horsemen in this image convey um, that crucial factor in battle. And the artist may have felt it important to uh, portray the followers of Muhammad as a powerful force. Um, and it is possible that, you know, this early army of quote-unquote believers came to represent the first of many Islamic armies. And thus, the artist sought to show it as a powerful force. Okay, the destruction of the idols. Um, I think this is a very important uh, visual source. Um, because, you know, you have to think, what view of pre-Islamic Arab religion do the images of the idols suggest? You know, a polytheistic religion... It's very different from the monotheistic Islamic faith. Um, you know, even an animist religion with gods centered on idols, which is very different 
from the basics of Islam. But, you know, what fundamental religious teachings or spiritual truths does the image or the painting seek to, you know, present here? And how might you understand the Muslim concern with idolatry? There we go. Well, the gods of the pre-Islamic Arab religion were false idols that had to be destroyed, right? They could not be tolerated in this new Muslim faith uh, that emphasized a single and all-powerful God. And, you know, that's, that's definitely, you know, how you can understand their concern with the idols. And then some traditions suggest that Muhammad ordered pictures of Mary and Jesus uh, within the Kaaba be left intact. And what purpose might this tradition serve? What well, emphasizes that Muhammad was the last in line of prophets that included Jesus, right? Mary's his mother. And it reinforces the idea that the religions of the book, right? Christianity, Judaism, and Islam possess a rightful place within the Islamic world as defined in the Quran, specifically Judaism and Christianity. Um, that's the religions of the book, Christian Jews or people of the book. And so they should be within the Islamic world. And, you know, Muhammad was definitely uh, influenced by the ideas and the doctrine of Christianity and Judaism. Let's see, which one? This one. I mean, you know, the Archang Ar Archangel Gabriel is coming to Muhammad to tell him that he's going to, you know, he's a prophet and going to become a messenger of God. What does this remind you of? Right? When the angel Gabriel goes to Mary and says, guess what? You're going to carry uh, the only son of God. You're, I mean, you're going to be his mother. Yeah, so you can see the similarities and in the, the influences here. Um, but this is the last image for Chapter 9, The Worlds of Islam, and those Afro-Eurasian Connections.